Coming up on market shares, the bridge collapse outside Baltimore has wreaked havoc on one of the country's biggest ports. How this is impacting trade. And an interview with the founders of Slice Sports Management, how they're helping NIL athletes. And the market's ending the first quarter at record highs. Hold on to your wallets because market shares starts right now. FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed has been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Welcome to Market Shares. I'm Bradley Hoffenstein. And I'm Peyton Felsey. This sentencing was due to the massive fraud and conspiracy that brought down his cryptocurrency exchange and related hedge fund. Back in November, a jury convicted Bankman Freed of seven counts and held him responsible for roughly $10 billion of customer deposits that went missing in 2022. The sentence from the Manhattan federal court was significantly less than the 40 to 50 years in prison that federal prosecutors wanted, but much more than the five to six years Bankman Freed's lawyers suggested. And earlier today, the inflation report for February was released and inflation rose in line with expectations, Peyton, for the month and the Federal Reserve will likely keep those interest rates on hold before it starts to consider cuts later this year. The Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index also increased almost 3% and was up 0.3% from this time a year ago. Both of, the, both of these numbers match the Dow Jones estimate along with this increase. Consumer spending was up almost 1%, well ahead of expectations. Markets expect the Fed to remain on hold um, in their May meeting um, and then begin rate cuts in June. And the markets closed today uh, for the holidays. Let's get to an interesting story in sports gambling. Seven of the largest gaming companies are joining forces to create a trade group. Now, this is an effort to promote responsible gambling. And for the first time ever, they'll share information about gamblers with a problem. The seven operators, including FanDuel and DraftKings, will form the Responsible Online Gaming Association, or ROGA. The members account for more than 85% of the legal online betting market and collectively have invested $20 million to fund ROGA. This new organization comes as sports betting has seen dramatic growth across the U.S., but as gambling has become more mainstream, so have headlines involving betting scandals. The group hopes to work together to promote responsible gambling practices across the industry. And if you're making bets on the March Madness College Basketball Tournament, don't spend all of your winnings right away. That's because the IRS considers all money made from gambling to be taxable income. This means that between 10 and 37 percent of winnings will be owed as taxes. And if you're thinking about not reporting the winnings, the IRS has ways of finding out, even with casual bets between friends. Gambling websites and apps will typically send a W2G form, which is a record of your earnings, if you win more than $600. But the IRS can also discover discrepancies by comparing your income with this form or just by examining your bank account activity. All right, we need to have at least one AI story every week here. Uh, some big moves for Amazon this week. The tech giant is making the largest investment in its three-decade history as it looks to gain an edge in artificial intelligence. The company is spending almost $3 million to back AI startup Anthropic. Over the past year, Anthropic has closed five different funding deals worth around $7.3 billion. The company's products compete directly with OpenAI's ChatGPT in both enterprise and consumer worlds. And we'll have to see if this one ends up being more of a business or political story. But Trump Media and Technology Group, the owner of Truth Social, started trading this week with a bang. DJT surged 56% up to $78 when it began trading at Tuesday's opening bell. Trading was actually briefly stopped due to all the activity around the stock. And by close on Tuesday, the Trump Media Group ended at around $60, where it's been steady since. You can see on your screen that slide earlier in the week, but despite that downturn to 60 a share, Wall Street is still valuing the company at nearly $11 billion, which many experts say is too high and just unrealistic. And Trump's stake is now worth more than $4 billion, but it's all paper gains for now. He can't sell his shares for another six months, but it's expected he'll sell eventually to help with his ongoing legal cases. 
and an interesting turn in the Reddit IPO. Shares plunging almost 25% in two days after a rally around the IPO last week. Tons of insiders at Reddit are selling their shares just days after the company went public. CEO Steve Huffman and other top execs said on Wednesday they sold. Huffman alone saying he sold 500,000 shares for about $16 million. Reddit CFO sold 72,000 shares for $2.3 million. In total, it was more than $40 million worth of Reddit shares sold by all the people on top. Reddit stock took a dive almost 15% as a consequence. Um, and, range, and their range is 50 a share. Ozempic, a new study from Yale says Ozempic, the $1,000 diabetes drug, can be made for less than $5 a month. Novo Nordisk currently charges almost $1,000 a month for the injection of the drug before insurance. Demand for the medicine has soared over the last year, and even as some insurers drop them from their plans due to that high cost, the study comes uh, after years of pressure on the company to slash high cost of the diabetes care. Uh, especially insulin. And two of the world's largest credit card networks, Visa and MasterCard, have agreed to settle a decades-long antitrust case. The settlement is set to lower swipe fees that merchants pay when customers make purchases. Typically, swipe fees cost merchants 2.2 to 4 percent, but this change would lower those fees at at least 4 point, uh, at least 0.4 percent. Excuse me. Allow allow. Although retailers have long argued that these fees force them to charge higher prices, these, this change may not save consumers much money. That's because this settlement gives merchants the ability to charge surcharges on customers. This would likely hit cardholders who get rewards such as cash back and airline miles. However, nothing is finalized until it gets approval from the U.S. District Court in New York. And even then, the case could be appealed. Earlier Tuesday morning, a massive cargo ship struck the Francis, Key, uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing it to collapse. This has closed the port and for the foreseeable future and disrupted local business and even global supply chains. Reporter Ben Bashik is here to break down the latest economic and trade developments. Ben? Yeah, while the closure of the Baltimore port may not have a substantial impact on national inflation or GDP, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions stand to lose billions of dollars. The Dolly, a 984-foot-long cargo ship weighing 213 million pounds, lost power, sending all 1.6 miles of the bridge plunging into the water and taking the lives of six workers. Baltimore ranks first in the U.S. for automobile imports, handling 850,000 vehicles last year. Other commodities include coal, sugar, lumber, and roll-on, roll-off cargo like tractors and construction equipment. Governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, emphasized the bridge's national impacts. Everybody who is buying cars, for everybody who is buying farm equipment, we're the largest port in the country that does that. So this is not just impacting Maryland. This is impacting that farmer in Kentucky. It's impacting that auto dealer in Michigan. The port handled $80 billion worth of imports and exports in 2023 and is projected by CBS to lose out on $9 million for every non-operational max capacity day. President Joe Biden pledged full federal support. It's my intention that the federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect the, the Congress to support my effort. But it's not just the trade. The collapse will reroute the bridge's 35,000 daily vehicles, causing traffic tie-ups on the Interstate 95 corridor, a major artery along the East Coast. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg visited the site, noting the challenges ahead. The path to normalcy will not be easy. It will not be quick. It will not be inexpensive. But we will rebuild together. For the past few years, commerce has faced a lot of global challenges. How have all these disruptions, like this recent bridge collapse, affected shipping costs for those suppliers? 
Yeah, Bradley, I'm sure uh, consumers have noticed that shipping costs have nearly doubled from a year ago due to reasons like the drought in the Panama Canal, terror attacks in the Red Sea, the war um, in Ukraine and Gaza, and of course still emerging from that COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, with this bridge collapse, we're risking multiple insurance suits, looking at liability suits, um, medical costs and rebuilding expenses um, that could make the sea largest ever marine insured loss at two to four billion dollars. Definitely a number we're going to keep an eye on going forward. Ben Bashik, thank you so much. After the break, we sit down with the founders of Slice Sports Management. Stay tuned. Thank you. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. But what? My. Welcome back. We're continuing our Student Spotlight Series today with two people who are already making waves in the college sports, NIL, and marketing space. Jacob Tillam and Brandon Gilbert founded Slice Sports Management last year and are bringing their expertise from the Falk School and their industry experience to the sports marketing and NIL brands. Slice offers all kinds of comprehensive marketing services and guidance to athletes from all sports and backgrounds. And it's my pleasure to be joined by those two founders right now. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having it's us. Good to have you on. Uh, there's a lot of reasons and a lot of talk about the NIL and sports marketing space, especially since those uh, court cases and states kind of changing their laws, NCAA changing their rules. Um, what inspired you guys to start Slice Sports Management, especially as students in college? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So my entire life, I've just been very motivated to succeed in the sports industry. Uh, I applied early decision to Syracuse. I really wanted to get into the sport management program here. Thought that a lot of internships would just fall into my lap, and that wasn't the case. I mean, I got rejected from a bunch of internships, whether it was the men's basketball team, the women's basketball team, the Syracuse Crunch, the Syracuse Mets. Started to get paranoid about my resume, and I saw this NIL as a, not only a great opportunity for you know st uh, athletes to finally monetize on their name, image, and likeness, but also motivated, hungry students like myself. So. Uh, co-founded it with Jacob and it's been a lot of fun so far. Yeah, it seems like in NIL there's still a lot of things people are trying to figure out. You know, it's still a relatively new phenomenon yeah. in college sports. Uh, what do you guys uh, market as your selling point? Yeah, so I mean, in short, we want to give a every athlete uh, a slice of success. Um, but now it really starts, there's a sort of a trickle down effect that we have. So there's Brandon and I, um, we're extremely motivated, hungry students just looking to gain experience and we're demons with the with with our outreach we reach out to every brand possible and then it trickles down to our roommates they're also working with slice and they also send out emails and then we have interns who also send out emails so it's really just the whole pitch is you know we like to believe that we could get any athlete in touch with any of their dream brands um and it's we're just an extra outlet to you know any athletes uh, nil and we just want to ha let them make the most of their opportunities and capitalize on that and try to make it as easy as possible. So you two are the faces of the brand. You guys are running the show. But how many total uh, members are on your team? You got it. Sure. We have, uh, I'd say there's us two. We have about five other people that are kind of considered employees, I guess, and then another five outreach interns. Uh, so that's 10. 
we have someone running our social media, 11, and then we have some organizational people that help out there. So it would be around 13 or so, I think, is gotcha. the number. All right. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways you could go about getting in touch with athletes, and you guys have a long list of athletes you've worked with. What's, uh, what's the way you guys like to go about that? How do you get in touch with athletes, or do they reach out to you? What's the experience been so far? Absolutely. So, yeah, in the beginning, it was definitely we were doing Instagram DM messages. I, I definitely believe in the power of Instagram DM. You could get in touch with celebrities, athletes, whoever, just by a simple message. So a lot of it was just cold outreach, just Instagram, and, uh, Instagram DMing athletes. But uh, over time, athletes have been reaching out to, you know, the Slice Instagram account, asking for management, and that's actually how – we signed one of our best athletes, DeAsia Fair. She just reached out to Slice and she said, I'd love some management and we were more than happy to help her. That was a big signing, so congratulations uh, you. to you guys. You know, when I was just kind of running through your website, trying to learn things about the company, I saw you have a quote on there. Your team has a proven track record of securing lucrative deals for your clients and you're always exploring new ways to help those athletes succeed in the ever-changing sports marketing landscape. Uh, tell me about some of those lucrative deals and. What have been, besides the Asia, what have been some of your most successful stories so far? For sure, yeah. I mean, that's, it starts off uh, probably with working with American Eagle. That was an opportunity that came to us pretty early on last, uh, last semester. We had an athlete by the name of Jed Miller playing at Montana State. He's an athlete influencer. He posts content every day. Um, we were reached out to by American Eagle. This kind of, in our mind, we rank brands by letter. This is like an S-tier brand. You know, the two of us have been wearing American Eagle since we were as old as we can remember. Um, and it was just a super big blessing to be able to, you know, help, help one of our athletes create content for their brand. Um, and then another kind of success story that I'd like to say is uh, how we signed Otto Landrum, the, uh, the high mom guy. Uh, pretty much, we were both on, on break. Uh, Brandon was away uh, in Aruba, I believe. And I was just home, just chilling. I saw the high mom video immediately sent it in our slice chats. I was like, everyone needs to DM this kid. We, we need him. Like, this is kind of just the missing piece to what we're trying to build. And uh, Brandon was lucky enough to get him to respond kind of in the midst of him uh, blowing up and gaining all these followers. Uh, Brandon was obviously away, so in the beginning we wanted to, uh, we wanted to wait until he was back. Um, but then we really just like wanted, we talked a little bit, we saw an opportunity to just get in with him right that second and dropped everything. We scheduled a call with him the next day. Uh, we got him signed a few days after that, and we've been working with him since. It's resulted uh, in a trip to Boston, which hopefully we'll do some oh. more of those soon. Um, and yeah, we got to meet Otto. He's a great kid, great person. And funny guy. Yeah, <laughs> funny guy. Definitely, definitely one of our bigger success stories and one of our most, our more proud moments was signing him. Yeah, I mean, that to me speaks volumes, just the power of social media in the NIL space, not just for contacting athletes and getting in touch with them, but there's a lot of deals you see that are strictly social media deals um, yeah. as well. And the American Eagle thing is fantastic. Um, good for you guys on that front. Thank you. Um, well, you know, talking about NIL, you always hear about those deals worth millions of dollars, right? right? Like I remember Bryce Young made, I think, a million dollars before he even got to Alabama, before he even <laughs> played a snap. Oh, yeah. Um, is, is the goal of you two to get to that level and have those million dollar deals or do you prefer working with some smaller, smaller numbers, maybe lesser known athletes? Yeah, so I mean, just starting with Slice, I mean, it, it all started with a passion project. It was a way to get our foot in the door. It was a way to put something on our resume. Uh, of course, we would love to be doing the million dollar deals like, uh, like that Bryce Young had, but uh, we definitely live in, live in the moment day by day and just seeing what happens. Uh, I definitely believe that we could get to that part uh, at some point in time, but right now it's just uh, uh, working with what we have and seeing what we can do, so one day at a time. Yeah, uh, and you know, I have to ask, obviously being a student, your life is busy enough as is, yeah. but I have to ask, as a fellow student who's you know, involved in a <laughs> lot of other things on campus, what do you find as some of the challenges of simultaneously being a student and running a company? It's tough. I mean, I'm definitely blessed. I'm a morning person. I'm trying to convince him to become a morning person. Too. Waking up at 6 a.m. Yeah. Getting but, uh, into it. But uh, yeah, just it's a lot of it, I, I believe, is just waking up early in the morning and, you know, just getting the day started, whether that's going to the gym, uh, you know, sending out emails before you go to class. Um, you know, it definitely is tough with homework and studying for exams and everything like that. School does come first. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just staying on top of everything. And I definitely think the key is just waking up early in the morning. Yeah, that's kind of the, the common answer is, you know, it's all about time management. 
Uh, Jacob, I want to throw this one to you to finish us off here. You know, a lot of people say that between NIL and the, the changes to the transfer portal, college sports as we've traditionally known them are kind of dying or at least sig significantly changing. What is your guys' response to that as people just getting into the space? Yeah, so I mean, that's all um, very new stuff within the industry. And um, something that I just like to say, for, like to answer that is, you know, there's a common misconception about, about NIL in that it's, um, you know, these million dollar deals and this, that, and the other pay to play, stuff like that. And what we do, we don't, we don't really operate within any of that. Uh, we don't really deal with the collectives, things like that. We're looking to, to market players and connect them with brands and get, build, help them build more of a digital presence and identity through, through their brand deals. Um, so that's really like what, what we're about. And you know, college sports right now is, is an ever-changing landscape. And um, I'm more than confident that you know, the NCAA and, and the government are gonna you know, eventually work something out to make NIL work all across the board. Um, it might be a little messy right now, but I definitely do see opportunity for you know, resolution and, and the Wild West to you know, become more normal. Yeah, I mean, you hear about these massive deals, but at the end of the day, NIL is to give those college athletes the opportunities or the opportunity to make some money because a lot of them don't go professional. The majority Absolutely. do not. Uh, Brandon Gilbert and Jacob Tillum, thank you both so thank much you. for coming on. Thank I wish you. you both the best moving forward. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, after the break, we'll have your market update and some of the biggest movers of the week. Stay with us. Welcome to an excellent episode of Live from Studio B. Welcome back. Let's get right to our market update. Now the market's actually closed for the holiday today, but we're going to look, take a look at how things ended yesterday. We're going to start off. Uh, there's actually some some data released yesterday that we talked about earlier that the economy grew faster than expected in the fourth quarter last year. But here's the big thing: the Dow and the S and P ending the first quarter of this year at record highs. The Nasdaq just about unchanged on the week. A lot of optimism around artificial intelligence and the S&P and expectations the Fed is going to start cutting interest rates uh, later this year. Yep, and double digits in the first quarter, historically, that just means that the, the market's going to remain strong for hopefully the next three quarters as well. And the Dow flirting with breaking 40,000 for the first time ever, so we're going to continue to watch that here on Market Shares. Let's get to our movers for the week. Going to start things off with Tesla, but I actually want to look at one month here because it's just been a disastrous uh, quarter for Tesla. It could be their worst maybe ever. Shares are down about 29% on the quarter, about 13% just this month alone. It's the worst period for the stock since the end of 2022 and the third steepest quarterly drop on record. Uh, sales are declining uh, for Tesla. They have the most popular car in the world, but their sales are going down because they're facing increased competition in both Europe and China. So now Elon Musk, he's basically saying, all right, I need something to pull these people in. So he's offering their full self-driving for a month to current Tesla owners and if you buy a new car. But I don't know if that's really going to rebound the stock and rebound their deliveries. 
Uh, Tesla shorts are also very high right now, about five and a half billion dollars worth of shorts, one of the most profitable names in the US. But when it comes to their deliveries and increasing competition, it's not really clear what they're going to do to fix these issues, Peyton. And Elon thinks that uh, he's going to bet on those Tesla customers and shareholders that they'll stick with the company. But there's not really any evidence to back that up right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we always talk about Tesla. We also talk about Disney. So let's take a look yes. at what they're looking like right now. So they're at 52 week high, which is weird because last year they were at a record low. So the year to date is at 35 percent. They're sitting at about 20, uh, excuse me, 120 per share. But UBS raised their target to 140 a share. Um, and what's why is all this happening? Well, they have impl impl implementation of company turnaround plans, so they shook up some of their leadership, as we know. They're cutting people. The purchase of Hulu also helped. Uh, they're cracking down on passwords, and they have a lot of sports partnerships going for them right now. So this is one that they're saying bye. Yeah, Disney this week actually finally launching their merged Hulu and uh, Disney Plus app. And there's a bit of a feud right now between Bob Iger and uh, Nelson Peltz. He's, Peltz is basically trying to get some board seats. But despite this feud that started in way back in like November, Disney stock has been on a tear to start the year. Yep. All right, we have one more mover. Let's take a look at our last mover. We have Estee Lauder. Um, Estee Lauder, Bank of America upgraded them to buy. So last year, basically during COVID times, a lot of people weren't buying their makeup. I mean, I know I was sitting at home. I wasn't wearing makeup. I wasn't going out. So their sales just weren't high at all. So they're pretty much at a, they're at the bottom. And so right now they're saying to buy because their revenue can only go up, Bradley. Yeah, and also they're going to start selling their products on Amazon, so hopefully that should make things more accessible. Yep, they're better products, better marketing. Coming up on Market Shares, two popular fast food chains are expanding their partnership nationwide. Stay tuned. They call me Maxi, but I prefer Tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Find it. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. All right, welcome back. Some good news for fast food lovers. McDonald's is expanding their partnership with Krispy Kreme. The company plans to sell donuts nationwide at McDonald's chains by the end of 2026. The rollout will begin in the next few months, but will take roughly two and a half years to complete. But Krispy Kreme has to double its distribution. The two chains relationship began about a year and a half ago, and the demand from McDonald's customers exceeded expectations. Shares of Krispy Kreme soared almost 30% earlier this week and was on track for its best day in history. Okay, Bradley, what do you think this partnership is going to look like? I'm curious. Okay, so I remember sitting in this exact seat last semester, and I pitched to my co-anchor at the time, Peter Elliott, a Big Mac between two Krispy Kreme glazed donuts. Is this something that you would eat? I would try it just, just <laughs> for the sake of supporting the partnership. I would try it. Okay, I think that they're probably going to do something like fun with some dessert, possibly. Um, yeah, that's, that's my guess. But I think you're on the right track with the 
Yeah, with the buns. <laughs> uses the people, people sleep on McDonald's desserts and honestly their breakfast too. So this is just going to add to that entire component of the chain. And it's of good course. news for Krispy Kreme as well. Their stock on an absolute tear on this news to end the week. Yep. Well, that's all the time we have for you today on Market Shares. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citrus TV News and throw us a like on Facebook. I'm Bradley Hoffenstein. And I'm Peyton Spellacy. Have a great night, Syracuse.